Hey, gorgeous. How are you? Hey, I'm so excited to be doing this interview with you. Me too. And thank you so much for doing this as well. Honestly, when I decided to do an interview series, you were one of the first people that came to mind because to me, you really just like embody what it means to be a leader in our generation. Like you're authentic and Mm -hmm. you're transparent and you lead with such like courage and bravery. So just thank you so much for coming to do this. Well, thank you for thinking that. <laughs> That's really sweet of you, and I appreciate it. That's a huge compliment. All right. Well, let's um, jump straight in. I really wanted to have yeah. you talk about, um, why don't you just tell us all a bit about your story and your experiences and what's gotten you to where you are today? Yeah. So I don't know how like, this this conversation could take up an entire hour, so I'll keep it really brief. Um So I'm a life coach and I get to work with women and the big thing I talk about with my clients is coming alive to who you really are. And I knew that I was passionate about that, but I wasn't really sure as I was kind of forming with that belief where that came from. And looking back, I grew up in a family where women were not allowed to be who they really wanted to be. And they, they, they held themselves back for the sake of other people. And I also experienced verbal abuse and I had some like family traumas. And, um, so I, I kind of left for college feeling extremely insecure in who I was and through college, like just had, it was kind of like, I kept having the same experience of people over and over and over again that kept making me feel like I wasn't worthy, that who I am wasn't good. And, um, we'll probably talk about this a little bit in the, rest of the call, but I was involved in a really conservative religion where my loud personality isn't exactly welcomed for women always. So, um, I kind of, whenever I found coaching, realized my passion for helping women. I had actually wanted to be a sex therapist. I don't know if I ever told you that. So I wanted to be a sex therapist first in college. And when I was, um, at a, um, what's it called? internship. I was at an internship and I, I I just hated it so much. And I felt like people that were going to that certain facility were just complaining and not able to like move on. And I realized that I probably one wasn't ready to help people because I wasn't a healthy person, but also I'm really sensitive. And so talking about trauma all day was really hard on me and I wasn't able to leave it there. So I started searching for, you know, something else that could help me do what I wanted to do in the world and really condensed version. But a couple years later I found coaching and, um, it has just, it's that I kind of feel like coaching chose me and not the other way around. So, um, so yeah, that's my really, really short version. (laughs) Okay. So having gone through all of those experiences, what do you now know to be true, like, about life, about the world, and about yourself? Like, how have your beliefs really changed, and now, like, what do you really know to be true? Yeah, so I think that this was such a hard question when you gave me this question earlier. I was like, oh, my gosh, how do I answer this? I just, I know that life is always changing and moving forward and evolving and expanding, and I, I like to think of myself that way as well like who I am today I I won't be this person tomorrow or next year and I think that that's how all people are if you're alive you're changing you're growing you're evolving so maybe the only constant in life is that everything will change (laughs) it doesn't sound really good um and nothing is stagnant and I think I mean I hate to be cliche but I think that like love is a really big part of what I want to contribute to the world so Maybe I don't have all of the like, philosophical answers for that, but I like to choose to believe that love is the force that runs the world. Yeah. Or at least wants to run the world. I don't have all the answers yet. I'm, I'm figuring it out. Yes. I love that. That's so beautiful. And what would you, like, how do you make sure that you're constantly, like, growing and changing and evolving? Because I think that, like, sometimes it is easy to get, like, become really stagnant and complacent with our lives. So what do you do to be, like, really proactive about that? Man, I love personal development. Yeah. I mean, I'm a life coach. <laughs> like, I I love it. I like I see a life coach. I have a counselor. I'm very self aware. So I'm journaling. I like to work out. Like I even go through phases with what workouts I'm doing because I like to 
be doing different kinds of things. Like sometimes I'll be a runner and sometimes I'll be a yogi. Like I'm not very consistent with perfecting one certain kind of like workout as much as I am like diversifying the things I'm able to do. Um, I also am a podcast binger. I listen to so many podcasts and, um, I've been trying to listen to less to like digest them better, but I have been known to listen to them like on the fast button. Like, do you know that that's a thing that you can do? Yeah. Yeah. So I, was, I can't always understand them at the, the times two rate, but the times 1.5 is, like, perfect. Yeah, so, um, so, yeah. yeah. It's a number of things. <laughs> My husband thinks I'm a uh, personal growth, like, freak a little bit. I'm – I think if, whenever you experience being stuck for so long – and feeling like there aren't options for you whenever you discover there are, it kind of becomes an, a, an obsession. And I'm health, I'm happy with letting it be a healthy obsession. So That's amazing. Yeah. I actually, um, I think I saw it on your Facebook, the Tony Robbins podcast about the six human needs. I so to good. I listened to it like, like six, six times. times. Yeah. Well, I listened to that um, after I saw it pop up on your feed and, oh my gosh, absolutely blew my freaking mind. I realized how much of my life had been governed by my need for like uncertainty and variety. Like that is a massive one yeah. for me. Anyone that's watching this, um, head on to yeah, Tony Robbins podcast and it's the six human needs. It will just blow your mind and it'll just help you understand yourself and why you do the things you do and the people around you as well, why they do the things they do so much better. Just blew my mind. But yeah, yeah, one of the needs that he talks about is the need for growth. We need to feel like we're evolving and, and changing and expanding because it's the nature of the universe. The universe is constantly expanding and we are, yeah. you know, the sum total of, of the universe. We're made up of the same stuff. So it makes sense that we'd want to go in the same direction. Yeah. yeah. And one of the, one of the other ones is significance. And I was thinking a lot about how I think the growth gives me a sense of significance in the universe somehow. So it's like, those are, and I think he talks about how three, if you, if you can meet three of them, it's an addiction. So I'm sure it gives me some sort of addiction, and I'm addicted to it. And I'd rather be addicted to personal growth than a lot of other addictions. So, <laughs> so yeah, I'm fine with it. Yeah, so good. That's awesome. Well, a lot of um, what I talk about like on my blog and with my tribe is this idea of like success and what it means to be successful. So my big thing is encouraging people to redefine success and actually really decide what it means to them to be successful rather than just following what the world tells them that they should do. Um, so what's your definition, definition of success and what does it mean to you to be successful? It's so funny because I have my notes here and the thing I wrote down was success is defined by the person. And you just said that and it's amazing. I think, I guess because I can't really define success for anyone else, I know that success for me, um, it's going to look different in each season. I think like right now, success is having relationships that I can really count on and having people in my life who I can love well and support them. Um, I also... I love doing things like I like, I don't want to say I like being successful, but I like doing things with excellence. And so, um, doing something with excellence and putting good work into the world is really important to me. So I, I mean, I would obviously love to make a living doing the things that I love creatively, but, um, I think whenever you're producing excellent work that comes. Yeah, absolutely. Having that freedom to really like, decide how you want to spend your time and where you want to invest your energy as well. Like it's just, yeah, that's so I love that idea of investing energy. I've been thinking a lot about that with, I listened like, it was like last week I listened to like four podcasts and they all talked about, it was like the theme of everyone, everyone's podcast I listened to last week was all about investing your energy into worthy causes. So yeah. Yeah. That's hard to do. Totally. Because it's like, it's what we have to give the world. We have our time, talent, and our treasure. And like so much of, for me, like I value my time like so, so much. So for me, if I'm ever doing something that I don't feel like it has a meaning or a purpose behind it, or it's not going to, um, you know, fulfill or satisfy me or someone else in any way, I get really like frustrated by that. To me, that's like the ultimate form of like being trapped and feeling like, yeah, like I can't move. So, um, yeah, it's uh, so yeah. important. Yeah. yeah. Well, let move on there was one question I really am really excited to ask you because a lot of like my tribe we're sort of 
want to change the world where yeah like you said visionaries and idealists and it can get really overwhelming when we look at all the need that's happening that there is exists in the world right now so to you like and it's really important obviously to just choose like one or two causes that you're going to invest a lot of your time and energy in because otherwise you just run around trying to fix everything and it just doesn't work you just end up oh, wow. <laughs> so to you what do you yeah. feel like the biggest problem that our world is facing right now is Man, <laughs> this is like you said, it's such a big question, and I, I don't know if this is necessarily like scientifically the biggest problem in the world because you know, like there's world hunger and there's like there's global warming and there's so many things that I really want to be passionate about. But the thing that hits me the most is injustice. Whenever I see people being oppressed or treated poorly, I get so mad, and I think it's actually like, one of the causes of my path for, like, coaching is because I think, like, I'm very passionate about women. I identify as a feminist, and I, like, learned to not be ashamed of that title, which, unfortunately, some people have to feel ashamed of that. But, like, oppression against women, oppression against, race, like, different races, I think that the issue with Syria right now, and I'm in the States, obviously, and there's a lot of talk about what we're going to do about Syria, and if we're going to let them in or not, and it's just like, I get, I have to actually really be cautious of how I let that in, because I get so upset when I see people being oppressed, so, um, so yeah, I think the issue of human kindness and compassion is huge, and I've actually, um, I have a small, like, podcast in what is it called I'm like losing my mind because I'm so into this topic um the bravery board we have local gatherings and our topic last month was compassion and it just got me thinking about how I buy my clothes and if I'm buying them ethically and if I'm supporting women grandmas children you know people in other countries who are working all day for like no wages or are enslaved to that. So it's not things people love to talk about, but it's something that uh, strikes a chord with me and I'm trying to be a little bit more conscious of in my everyday life. Yeah. So yeah, that's so true. And I was actually having a conversation um, with, you know, Heidi, my coaching buddy from beautiful you about this yesterday. Yeah. We were talking about how like you can feel really powerless to that stuff that's going on overseas. Like I watched a documentary called the true cost. I don't know if you've seen that one. It's about the fast fashion industry. And yeah. How many of like the clothes that we wear were made by like um, children working for like five cents an hour in horrific conditions, factories that are ready to collapse any yeah. second. And there's just so many issues surrounding it. And it's hard to, it's easy to feel really like powerless and disempowered when we hear about all that, but we forget that, they're actually meeting a, a, a demand that we've created in the Western world. Like yeah. we hold the key to their freedom essentially by our consumer choices, by the things we buy, by the food we eat, by the, yeah, the choices that we make every single day. And I think it's, yeah, it's mm -hmm. so easy to look around and be over, really, really overwhelmed, but there's so many little things that we can do every single day to, to start like chipping away at those, at those issues and solving those problems like piece by piece. Um, but how do you, <laughs> how do you you that sound just like, like you so I'm so into what you're, you're saying, saying sorry <laughs> I'll let you I'll let you ask go ahead <laughs> how do you sort of see that coming through like in your coaching work like how do you um I guess like how does that all tie together like that idea of compassion and then like what you do with your clients well I actually wrote a piece on privilege that I sent to my tribe recently it was maybe it was like in the summer and it was like the least open like email I've ever sent and so I think that revealed to me that it's not that people don't care it's that well for one they're probably not coming to like they're not subscribing to my stuff so I can preach them about pr being privileged you know no one likes to be reminded like you're privileged like do something with it but I think the people who end up hiring me and working with me like it's not necessarily that I'm even talk, having this discussion with them. I don't think I've ever had this discussion with a client before because it's to me it's per, it's a personal passion, and I let my clients have their own things in the world that they're passionate about. Um, but compassion and kindness shows up in me being compassionate towards them mm -hmm. and like helping like be that space. I was talking with the client today and she was just like, it was her uh, six week mark in just six more weeks. And she was like, or six sessions, I would say. And she was like, 
kind of giving a review of what she's learned so far and self-compassion was a huge one. And that's just something that comes with all of this. And I think also with self-compassion comes compassion towards others. But I feel like what she said to me was, you know, I never have to feel guilty for like explaining myself and like saying what I'm going through. And I forget how necessary that is. Like, Recently, I had to, like, call my counselor and, like, actually, I emailed my life coach and called my counselor because I was having a really bad day. <laughs> and they held that space for me, and I was like, oh, yeah, this is what it means for people to have this as a safety net for to have someone who's not burdened by your problems. So, um, for me, it's, with my clients, it's less the conversations about what I feel passionate about in the world and more how can I hold that space for them so they feel like they don't have to be ashamed for having the perceived problems they have and where they're allowed to be themselves without judgment. So I love that. I absolutely love that. Especially what you said about like when you give people like a whole space for people to and guide people to have that compassion for themselves and that in turn Mm -hmm. leads them to have more compassion for those around them and and other people and causes in the world and it's almost the same as like connecting in with our own pain because like we have this habit especially in the western world of sort of just like we were speaking about before pathologizing our pain and suppressing it and pushing it down and that in turn Mm -hmm. like it cuts off our empathy like it it like hardens us against other people's pain because they're a reminder of all that shit that we don't want to face anymore. So when we actually open up the floodgates and get ourselves like connected back in, that's where like that empathy develops and we can start to, yeah, cultivate compassion and actually want to do something about it. So I, yeah, I completely agree that there's a massive link between like, yeah, getting people like into coaching and, and this personal development world. And then like, actually seeing the difference on a global scale. Like it makes me so excited yeah. when I think about it. Yeah. Hey, it's so funny. I have some friends, like some friends I'm no longer really that close to since I started being a coach who believe that coaching is very selfish and like hiring a life coach means that you're like worshiping yourself. And I really had to like question that a lot when I started coaching. Like, is this what it is? So like, how is this, is this self-focus? Is it actually like obsessing on yourself or how does it help people? And I've just come to see the amount of, since I've done a lot of self-work, the amount where I can actually love people now, whereas before I couldn't because I didn't love myself. And that sounds so cliche, but it's true. Like you cannot extend that love to other people if you hate yourself. Like that love is always tainted if you don't love yourself or it's, Maybe even always codependent. That might be a stretch, but so I kind of just, I mean, I just think that it helps you legitimately love people better by working on yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Completely agree. That's awesome. Everything you just said. Loved it. Okay. So having said that, what is your mission on this earth? If you could like sum it up in like a sentence or two. Yeah, (laughs) that's easy. No, um, I think that this is something that we're always learning. I wish that, like, it had been served to me on a silver platter, but it wasn't. And I think I'm always getting, like, more pieces of it to pull in. But I think in this, the things that I know about myself are that I'm extremely passionate and I have a loud voice and I like, cannot keep things to myself when I'm excited about them. Like, I'm a natural evangelist. So my... My mission, as far as I can see it, is to use that, like, that's just me, and use those things to create changes in the world. Um, right now, I'm doing it through coaching. I don't know. I Maybe I won't always be doing it through coaching, but for this season, it looks like putting myself to work in this arena and giving it my all until the next piece of the puzzle comes. So <laughs> if that makes, like, I don't know. I don't know what else will come, but... Um, I think also the passion I have towards women and like liberating women from systems that don't serve them is really important. So right now, again, that's coaching, but in the future, I would love that to like evolve and expand and look different. So yeah, yeah. that was more than two sentences. <laughs> no, I love it. I <laughs> that's so beautiful. And I think I was going to ask you about like, how did you discover it? Um, but I guess you've sort of 
touched on that when you said that it's like you using like the gifts that you've been given in the service of others and to me that's just yeah like, that's it that's what we're here to do like we're, we're born yeah. with these like incredible talents that no one taught us no one sort of has like really shown us how to do but all of a sudden we just yeah we it feels so natural to bring them forth into the world and if we can harness those gifts and work on them and then use them to help other people like that's the sweet spot right there <laughs> Yeah, and what's so funny is that those are the things, like, my strengths now are the things that I have to consistently, excuse me, be mindful of to be thankful for. They're, like, the the things that other people would look at me and be like, wow, like, look at this thing about her that's awesome, or the things that I'm like, oh, my gosh, I'm too loud, oh, my gosh, like, I, you know, I talk too much, which I do talk a lot, and there, I actually said this to a friend today, I feel like, they're like superpowers like everyone has their own superpowers and I feel like right now I'm in a season of learning to channel them to where they're like better and more laser sharp but that means I have to kind of like it's kind of painful to like watch it cut away so I think as we step towards our purpose and our calling and our mission whatever you want to say and we're like leaning into those strengths that comes with a lot of refinement and like that is not always fun and for me it has triggered a lot of like this is a bad thing about you so as opposed to like letting those voices those old voices tell me they're bad I'm trying to just own the fullness of them and be like okay like these strengths also have shadows and I have to own those shadows before I can channel them to make the strength even stronger. So, um, yeah, I'm trying to do that. It's a process. <laughs> it is such a process. And um, let me know how you go because I could use some tips. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. so funny. That, that was actually my journey last year. So um, those really? of you like, that have read my blog would know that like I was still like I was very self-destructive I just had this tendency to like self-sabotage and self-destruct like any chance mm-hmm. I got because I didn't believe that I was like worthy of having this amazing life with everything going really well at the same time it was also like I had an upper limit problem and um I had to learn to channel that like destructive energy into something that was actually going to serve me and, and serve the world and what I've realized is that it's actually like all that like internal like angst that I feel that wants like to go and drink an entire bottle of wine or go and like have a one night stand or finish a whole block of chocolate, whatever it is, it's actually just like creative energy and it's just being like misdirected and misused. And Mm -hmm. if I actually in those moments where I'm feeling those things actually sit down at my computer and like write, or if I go out and um, like have a conversation with someone that like really needs to need support, or if I just do something where I can allow that energy to express itself in a different way, then it actually becomes like productive and it's just so much more healthy and it's just, freaking change my life so yeah I can totally relate. that is so beautiful so for you when like I know you're interviewing me but like I have a question so um for you like would you say that that is something because I'm really curious about the idea of self-mastery and I don't know if I believe in it or not like I to me it's like wellness is a choice you make every day like if you stop working out after a while you're not going to be fit like you were once were if you stop eating healthy you're not gonna feel like you once did and so for me it's like I think people like I've actually had clients who think that because they book three months together that like they're gonna be good after that they're like no I'm gonna be good because I had a life coach and I'm like no this is a forever thing like this is lifelong so all that to say how has your experience been like once you made that decision of like I'm going to rechannel this energy what was that path like for you and is it still hard to make those choices yeah for sure awesome question I love that um I think with any like massive life change that we go through like it starts with like for me it always starts with like a revelation there'll be like an aha moment there'll be like well first of all they'll be like okay this isn't working and things will continually get worse and worse I'll get all these like cosmic nudges from the universe being like this is an issue you should pay attention to this and it can either be like I don't know, I keep just coming up against locked doors or like I had a car crash in 2013 and that was a massive for the yeah. universe. That was just like wake up and pay attention. Like something is going on here that you need to sort of like get your shit together. And um, so I think there's like, yeah, there's that initial revelation that, okay, like something isn't working. Then there's like the light bulb that happens when you discover, okay, like how can I do this differently? And you've got to get really curious about, okay, like, and that's where like coming and working with a coach is really helpful. Getting curious about what limiting belief is like, 
get, like forcing me to, to self-sabotage continually. What is this like loop yeah. that I keep going over and over in my mind? And then how can I change that? And how can I reframe that? And then after you reframe it, there's also like that process of integration that you go through. Like after you finish a coaching series, after you've like gone through a, like a really deep period of transformation where you have to make sure that like your actions are aligning with like your new highest thought so whenever you're placing yourself in that same situation so like for me whenever I got that urge to like go back on tinder or like whatever go out and get smashed it was like okay I know that this isn't going to serve me anymore I've had that revelation now I need to go and like match my new actions with like yeah that new highest thought about myself and it's totally I love that (laughs) but it's totally a process and you're going to backslide and you're going to um stuff up essentially but as long as you like you have that commitment it gets so so much easier the more that you go and that concept of self-mastery is really interesting I think like for me the biggest thing is just mastering like your mind, like, cause our mind, you know, it can either destroy you or it can lift you to like the greatest heights. It's like the most incredible tool that we have. Um, yeah. so I think that if you've like, if you've looked at all, like taken it apart and like looked at the way you think about things, like ex- really examine your beliefs, what works and what doesn't, um, and like created a really healthy foundation, then that's just gonna, gonna serve you and all the external stuff just falls into place. I hope that. Man. No, that's so good. Like, everyone who coaches with you is so lucky. Like, that is so wise. <laughs> like, seriously, I'm like, dang, that is so good. I wish I should, I'm going to rewatch this later and, like, take notes on what you just said because that was, that was so good. I, the only thing I, like, even could think to even add to, like, make that conversation, like, any better, which I don't think I can, but the thought I had, I guess that's a better way to put it. The thought I had was whenever I'm not living to that like highest thought, I'm miserable. Yes. Yeah. And I think people like my clients, myself, like people I know, we have these aha moments and then we think that like just knowing the aha moment is enough. And then we wonder like, why is my life not changing? And it's like, because other things probably need to elevate as well. And, man, that's good. I'm learning so much right now. <laughs> it's really good. Yeah, I love this. This really conversation's good. already taken. Like, I knew that it would. I knew that it would, like, take a different direction to what I expected. But, yeah, I just hope, really hope people are getting a lot out of this. Um, okay, so now, biggest failure. We've talked about backslides and messing up. What's been your biggest failure, personal or professional? I definitely, I'm definitely a positive person. And so I'm that kind of person that's like annoying, like, let's see the bright side in this negative, awful situation. And so I feel like I really try to take hard things and make them good. I don't really know if like, I don't know. Um, I've had a friendship failure. I guess I should, that's a, that's a big one. Um, I have like had major transformation in the way I do friendship. And that's actually becoming something that I'm talking about more in my work, um, with obviously discretion of those women, but I had, um, failure in friendship because I had failure of knowing who I was in the past. And so my insecurities and my inability to stick up for myself and, um, I would surround myself with people who didn't treat me well because I didn't believe I was worthy of love and I didn't believe I had a voice. And so I would have, I had friends that like picked on me and, I'm sure you can tell I'm like pretty like like loud person. And so for me, who like naturally talks a lot and everything to let let someone walk on me and tell me how to be and it doesn't align, it makes no sense, but that's who I was. And um so my doing that led to a lot of resentment towards friends. And eventually instead of dealing with it and like knowing how to have a healthy boundary and how to have healthy relationships, I let the relationship implode and um one specific girl I like I let it go on so long where she probably didn't even know how bad I was hurting and then I just like ended the friendship I just like cut it off and was like yeah we're done and I had that was a bad pattern in my life at that time I'm like really good at like cutting people out so um I tried to reconcile and she didn't want to I hurt her so bad she like she still Like, she recently moved from California back to where I live, and, um, like, I've reached out, and, like, she literally does not want anything to do with me. We we aren't friends on social media, and I grieved that friendship. It's probably been 
three or four years now. And, um, like I get anxious thinking about when I'll see her out and more so just because I like, I care about her and I feel guilty for the way I handled the situation. Do I think we were best for each other's lives? No, but I didn't treat her with kindness and love because I didn't know how, and that's a bummer. So I've learned a lot from that, like those kinds of failures. Um, and I'm really passionate about friendship now because of it. So business failure yet to be seen. I'll let you know. <laughs> I'll let you know when that one happens. It will. Yeah. <laughs> they kind of At least it'll feel like it. Yeah. Like, yeah, there have been things I've launched that people don't care about and stuff like that, but I'm just, I kind of see that as an experiment more than a failure mm, yeah. with friendship. It felt like a failure. Yeah. So, um, how so, yeah. did you sort of like, with the friendship situation, how did you like make peace with that? Like you said, you felt really anxious about like seeing her. How have you like now come to a place of, yeah, more inner peace? Yeah. So, um, I thought that I, like about a year ago, I thought that I was in a really good place with it. And, um, I, I would like kind of be proud of myself the way I could just like let people go. Like, yeah, I'm like really good at detaching. And my counselor was like, that's what people who have experienced a lot of childhood trauma say. (laughs) And I was like, great. You know, like, and I did, um, like I've had four or I've had, yeah, four stepmoms and I've had like, I have six siblings and none of us have all the same parents. And so I have a a very enmeshed family. People were in and out of my life. And that's just, that's, I want to say a skill, but the skill I picked up, like learning to say goodbye and learning to detach. And so I've had to work really hard at when things are uncomfortable in a friendship and when things are painful or when someone hurts me to not just leave because that is like my default. And that's just like, well, this isn't working and I know I can be happier somewhere else. So bye. And that's a great skill. If you're in an abusive situation, (laughs) if you, you know, like there are a lot of ways where you should be fed up and you should go, but there's also a lot of friendships and relationships that are worth fighting for. And learning the discernment between that has been helpful. I've created healthy friendships. I have really worked on creating safe people and being seen and allowing people to like be themselves to me and giving grace. And I also did a lot, I actually did some therapy work around that friendship and why I treated her the way I did and why I held resentment like I did and why I chose a friend who didn't love me for who I was. And Maybe she watch like watch her watch this and be like, yes, I did. I love you for who you were. I didn't perceive it like that. So um, I have to say I was a bad picker. I picked friends who I believed I was worthy of, who viewed me like I viewed myself. So um, creating healthier friendships has been very healing. And also forgiving myself for the way I treated her and forgiving her for the way she treated me. Um, and not caring what she thinks. Like, I found myself, like, years later, like, up until probably six months ago, caring, like, if she saw my life coaching stuff online. Like, what must she think that I'm talking about friendship online? You know, like, as if she's even paying attention to what I'm doing, which maybe she is, but probably not. So, um, letting go of, like, even, it's funny, I left that friendship because I didn't want to care about the way she, like, felt about my stuff anymore. But then I continued to obsess about what she might be thinking about what I'm doing long after I ended that friendship. So that shows me that a lot of it had to do with me. Yeah. So. It's exhausting, isn't it? I think, like, we can – we spend so much time and energy or we can – um, thinking about or worrying about how other people are going to perceive us and perceive our work and especially like this stuff it's really vulnerable like I've certainly posted like a lot about my personal life online and yeah. I love doing that to me like that's how we make connections and to me like that's how I can be of service is by sharing the real stuff and pulling back all like the yeah. bullshit Um, but the real revelation for me happened when I decided that like I can't control how other people see me all I can control is the intention with which I put stuff out into the world and if I'm, I know that my intentions are, are pure and true and good and I'm here to help then you know like that's that's really all I can control and that's all I'm going to concern myself with because everyone's going to have a perception of me and that perception is probably going to be more a reflection of them than it is of me um, but I love yeah this conversation about relationships and using that as like a tool for, for growth and development because like 
well, I believe that like we, um, like everyone comes into our life for a reason and whether like our souls like chose to come together to teach each other lessons that we needed to learn. But regardless of whether you believe that or not, if you look at your relationships as an opportunity, then all of a sudden it's not like, oh shit, here's this person again that I have to deal with. It's okay. How can I grow from this? Like, how can I learn from this? How can I like use this person as a mirror to see the parts of myself that I haven't yet come to accept and come to love yet? And that's just such a healthier place to come from. And it just makes it, it makes yeah. it so much more like exciting and, and enjoyable than rather than just having to deal with like shitty people all the time. Um, but yeah, thank you for, yeah. Sharing, for sharing that story. I know that, yeah, that's like really common, especially among like female friendships as well because we do really develop these really special connections and there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff that comes with that so thank you yeah it's just because someone doesn't understand what I'm doing and has their own opinions about it does not change that my work is true to me and does not change that like this is what I'm supposed to be doing so I try to take that kind of feedback and like listen to it like see if I can take anything of it that's true and then let go. Yeah. But it's difficult. It's difficult to do that. Yeah. Awesome. I hope you got any of that. I know we have a lag. So no, yeah, no, I, I've got. I'm getting it all. It's perfect. Um, okay, so now that you've sort of talked about, um, yeah, what you just said about taking it on board and then asking like, what of this is true, and then letting go of the rest. Like, I guess it ties in really well. So next question: Where do you look? for guidance yeah I love this question because I well I feel like first of all like and we've talked about a little bit I have had a really strong sense of faith and spirituality since I was a child and I got really involved in a conservative uh fundamentalist Christian like religion um in early college and I've since let parts of that go and rediscovering what it means for me to have the spirituality and that was a really painful journey where I kind of felt like I lost God and I kind of God died to me and um I actually haven't spoken about it a ton online but I'm feeling a lot more free to do that like at this point which is really cool so um I feel like in the past couple months, I'm just trying to figure out like what that connection is, but it's still there and it's just different than I thought it was. So, um, I feel like that first and foremost is like intuition, connection to God, whatever you call God, universe, source, um, goddess, if you like a female connotation better, which I kind of like that. Um, I don't know. I've never prayed to goddess before, but yeah. (laughs) Um, but yeah, that, that is my first place of guidance. Like that's inner self. That's kind of where I start. Um, and then the second part of that would be like, I feel like I have finally cultivated an amazing support system and I have friends who deeply know me and are there for me no matter what. And I have a life coach who is amazing. Her name is Steph Jagger. And I have a counselor who's local. He does energy work and therapy. So I feel like, my wellness journey has brought me from a place of just being isolated with me to having this community of people and who like truly accept me. And so, um, obviously we never people like my counselor and I had different spiritual faith beliefs, but I still try to take what he says and like apply his perspective with that like filter of what's true for me. So, um, so yeah, that, sense of grounding and who I am always comes first and then everything else. Okay. But. This is like, yeah, something that's going on for you at the moment and it's obviously really changing, but like, I guess now that you've, yeah, you're exploring this a little bit more, like how would you define God or like who or what is God to you? And then how do you connect with that like part of yourself? Yeah. So to me at this point, God is the source of all life and everything that's in the universe. So a lot of people say that God is the universe. And I don't know if that is the right word for me because to me, the universe is part of the thing that we live in. And my perception of God is like, God is even bigger than that. Like God is bigger than the universe. Um, so 
God is the source of everything. God is the energy of love. That it's, it's the fact that we can have this conversation and so deeply connect. And people listening can be like, "Oh, I feel that." Like that to me is God, and I don't know if that's there's a word for that. I do think the story of Christ is very beautiful. Um, I'm also really inspired by just people doing amazing things in the world and that they are inspired by what they believe to be God. And so that thing that connects us, grace, the idea of Christ, I don't have words for it quite yet, but, um, yeah, it's personal to me too. And I really wanted to be an atheist for a while after I left my faith, like my traditional faith. And then I like couldn't, because I couldn't deny this thing that was like connecting to something. So, um, hopefully in like six months, I have a better articulated version of that. No, it's, Check in. it's perfect. And it actually, it aligns really closely with like my, my beliefs as, as well. I've had a sort of similar experience and, um, except for me, like I grew up in a very like open home like my mom taught my sister and I to meditate when we were five um she taught what? us the 10 Native American Indian commandments like we grew up with crystals <laughs> and all of these different things that we got to choose what religion that we wanted to practice so like I wasn't baptized until I was like 14 or 15 and I chose to like to get baptized in the Anglican church at my school and then for me it's been like um I've, I guess I've been a bit of a seeker like finding what works but like similar to yourself I've always like felt that like inner connection and that um that sense of like innate spirituality that like there's so much more to life than what we perceive with our physical senses and that like who yeah. I am like at my core has been around long before I was born and will be around long after this physical body dies so I think yeah. to me like and as well for me like religion is just like it's just a vehicle and a vocabulary and a way that we connect with the divine and that looks different for everyone and part of my message and part of my mission is just about connecting people with what it what works for them like the vocabulary the um the the practices the tools the language that really resonates with them so that they can have this beautiful relationship and it's not up to anyone else to judge what that looks like or what that feels yeah. like but when you've got it you know like you know deeper than your yeah. soul that you know this is like this is it this is what I was here to do and it fills that void like for me I spent so many like years in my adolescence searching for things to fill like this void that I felt inside me this hole that that um, I had and I used, you know, like sex and drugs and alcohol and guys and all of these different things and, and nothing ever yeah. worked and it wasn't until I like, I walked into church and I started meditating and I started praying that I found like, oh, hold on a minute, this is what's supposed to go inside that hole. Like God created that hole so that yeah. he, could, he could fill it and that we could have that connection with him like here on earth, even in these physical bodies when we can't like see um, what's really going on so yeah it really aligns with like my own beliefs and yeah I'm so glad that we can have this conversation because I love talking about this stuff and it's just um I don't talk about, about anymore any, any, any of my friends are like are we still having a God conversation <laughs> I'm like yes we are it's important it's so important because like I think in, we live in such a secular society because so many people have been disillusioned by mainstream like religion and I get that like I t that's totally understandable because yeah like, a lot of, you know, a lot of um, religions have been, like, perverted and a lot of, like, holy books have been, like, twisted and used to promote, like, really selfish yeah. agendas. So to bring this conversation around to, like, this inclusive spirituality that, like, is accessible for everyone and that includes everyone, like, it's just, it's so important. I think it's what our world desperately needs right now. So, yeah. Oh, and I couldn't agree more <laughs> about, like, do I? Sorry. It's giving me goosebumps, that's all. <laughs> yeah. This is like the, probably the first podcast interview where I have felt, because I've been very hesitant. This has been a process for me for about a year now. And it, like I said, like it felt like God died to me and I didn't want to talk about it publicly because I didn't want to shame people for believing things. And I felt very angry. Like I was really angry and I was really confused because it was like, because you find so much community within a, a faith system, it felt like I lost that connection to those people as well. And so and I was, I'm, I, maybe I'm still kind of afraid of if I'm too open, then I might offend some of my followers and my clients. And I don't want to make, put them in a bad situation. I think eventually, like I'm so passionate about this topic. I will have to talk about it like more on like, 
in my work. Um, for now, I've left it out, but it feels really freeing to talk about it. And I do have to say, like, whenever growing up in a really, um, I hate to keep saying this, like this functional house, <laughs> in a very dysfunctional home, church was like something I sought out. And God was something that I sought out in in college or in high school. And the same thing with me, like it, it met me, it met all those needs I had. And so I can't be mad at something that gave me so much joy and fulfillment. And that was who I was then. And because I'm a different person now, that's changing. So I've been really appreciating the work of Rob Bell, Richard Rohr, the Liturgist podcast, Science Mike's podcast, his new book. So um, I'll send you all those links. So if anyone else has questions about this conversation, yeah, because it's scary to change what you believe whenever no one else understands. And that can be even what you believe about what work should look like. You know, like it can be beliefs about anything. So that's my rant. I'll send you all those links because they're worth listening to. Yeah, that's awesome. All right, well, I've only got a couple more questions and then um, we can wrap okay. up. Okay. But what is your idea of utopia? Like what does a perfect world look like to you? I don't, like, I don't know. I think, obviously, a world without oppression. Like, a world where people aren't treated badly, where people are allowed to express themselves, um, where people are kind to each other. It's hard for me to uh, really imagine a utopia, because I do believe in the power of choice, and I don't like the idea that that could ever be taken away from us. But maybe just, where people are given the opportunity to have like human consciousness at an early age where they're able to know themselves and make healthy choices as opposed to like, I mean, people hate on violent cultures and like a big issue right now in America is like, um, is black culture. And like it, the debates last night were last night for the polls, um, for the president. And they were talking about race and it was making me so upset because we don't realize that, like, for one, as white people in America, like, we don't understand what it's like to be another race here. And we also don't understand what it's like to have generations of poverty for certain specific groups of people. And no matter what we do, like, the generational mindset is passed on. And that's the same no matter what race you are. But, like, to be able to go in and, like, help I don't even, I don't, I don't know how it would be done, but in utopia, people would have the option to have all their needs met so they could become the person they're supposed to be. They would actually have opportunity and they wouldn't be profiled because of any certain way. So I don't know. That's all I really have about that (laughs) before I get too passionate. I love that. And it is like, it's a quality of opportunity. It's looking at, okay, like, because we're not all starting out on the same foot. I think and I see this no. a lot in like Western cultures, um, especially like in American and even in Australian culture. It's this idea of like the Australian dream or the American dream where if you work really hard, if you know, you know, bust your ass, if you like um, follow your dreams or whatever, then you'll make it. You'll get the house and the car and the white picket fence and the 2.4 kids. And it's just like, it's absolute Uh bullshit because no matter how hard you work, there is a system in place of social oppression and inequality that makes sure that you will never get past a certain place. And whether that's like, it's also, it's a structural like societal system that um, like doesn't give people the same access to like healthcare, education, which is obviously like physical inequality, but it's also like a mental, um, it's an inequality of a mindset. And it goes back to that thing that you said about the, the generational cycle of poverty that people are in, because if you grow up believing that you know you're here for no reason you're going nowhere and you're good for nothing that's exactly what you'll become and if you're growing up surrounded by poverty and surrounded in a world where your parents are yeah like working you've got a single mom that's working three jobs just to sort of you know pay the rent then what else is there if you can't see what else is out there then how are you going to actually break out of that and that's why I think like technology is incredible and social media is incredible and that's why I think like our generation has so much potential to actually change all of that because all of a sudden like access to things like education and things like this, like interviews where you're talking about, um, you know, like personal development and stuff like that. It's not just limited to a select few people based on like their wealth or their social status or their race. Like we really are like leveling the playing field. Um, and that's what makes me really excited about the future. But yeah, 
totally agree with everything you said. Quality of opportunity and yeah, like, um, yeah, it's awesome. Um, it's so good. You're so wise. <laughs> I'm like yes, yes, so good. <laughs> okay, last question. What do you love about our generation? I talk a lot about like yeah, like I just said, how excited it makes me that our generation like has the tools and um, the will to actually like you know turn this ship around. And we are at a pivotal point in history now. Like there's no de- denying like the environment's going to hell in a handbasket if we don't do something. Like politics is a mess. Yeah. Like so many things clearly aren't working. What do you love in our, about our generation and like? Do you see that potential there that we can, you know, change it before it's too late? I do not understand when people hate on millennials. I'm like, I'm one of the coolest people. Like, like I, I feel like I encounter people and they're like, especially when I was waiting tables, I had a guy like, oh wow, you're really, like, you're really driven. Like, especially for like someone in your generation. And I was like, what does that mean? Like, do you even hang around with people who are like? Or maybe because I was a waitress, he assumed that I didn't have aspirations. I don't know. But I was like, I feel like the millennial generation is highly underestimated. So I can hear my dog. She's like shaking off all this. She's so cute. Um, but I feel like we're underestimated. And the thing that I love about millennials is that they, they care about social issues a lot. And I think that is... So, I mean, I'm sure there are people from every generation who don't care and people from every generation who are lazy because there's just that we're people and people do stupid things sometimes, but there are so many people who do care. And like, I would say like 99% of my friends are doing awesome things in the world. They care, they're bettering themselves, they're trying to better the world. And they're also, I love this about millennials, they're, at least in America, which I'm pretty sure it's the same in Australia, the financial crisis changed what it looked like to be a millennial for like millennials in America are officially more in poverty than the elderly. And that's like the first time in his, the history that that's ever happened, which maybe I should be fact checked on that, but I'm like, someone can Google that and find out, but we're way more poor than our parents were at our age. And because of that, I think that we're way more resourceful and our idea of the American dream is changing, which is awesome. It's like, I don't necessarily see that as, yes, it it holds us back in some ways, but as an entrepreneur, it makes me excited for the people who are just like, I'm not going to do it the same old way. I'm going to pave my own path and like the self-belief it takes to do that. And also I think that our generation is really craving spirituality in a different way than our parents were. So those are the things. Yeah. I love that. It's like, it's sort of like we looked at our parents' generation and I know I certainly did this when I was growing up and I knew that I didn't want that. Like I didn't want a bar of it. I didn't want like the nine to five job where I sat in an office all day. I didn't want to be like, um, held back or like tied down to a mortgage or a particular like house um I didn't want to be shackled by student debt I am unfortunately um but me too yeah but it's sort of like there's this traditional path that our parents sort of set out for us that for them was very much like hailed as the path to success whereas we call like we're calling bullshit on it because we know that a lot of it was just sort of um it's actually there to to sort of oppress us and it's actually there to sort of widen the gap between like um, the, the lower and the, the higher classes. And I think, yeah, like that sense of like disillusionment and that sense of like dissatisfaction with the state of the world at the moment, the state, like the way that our countries are run, the way that like the financial systems are like colluding with governments and, and big corporations are basically running the country. Like we can see all of this, like we're, we're sort of tearing back the, the veil a little bit and like, it's so much more transparent now. Um, and like the people that I talk to and the people that I surround myself with, like we're not having a bar of it. And we know that once we get into those positions of leadership, once it's our turn to step up, which it is, things are going to change. Like shit's going to get really different and we're going to start dismantling things that no longer serve us. We're going to um, sort of get rid of this um, system and this idea that like some people are better than other people and are inherently like worth more and that, um, I sound like such a socialist right now, but <laughs> but it's sort of it's just this idea of equality, and I think that <laughs> yeah. Um, but I can talk all day on that. But um, but yeah, I'm so glad we're no, we, so we got glad. to touch on like so many different topics today. Oh my goodness, we've just like covered it all. I know. <laughs> but, um, we really did, and I I so enjoy it because to me, 
like I love getting to help women and I love getting to have women who are my clients and hey, I, I just, I love it. But the thing I love about it is that once you feel like you're in the process of healing, even you are that much more likely to do something about the suffering of others. And so the conversation is like, why I'm so passionate in the world and I don't always talk about these things on my, like, cause I, I'm serving my clients and helping them get to that step and they're, they're passionate about their own things. But this is the step that like gets me excited in my personal life a lot. So I'm so happy we had this conversation. Hey, awesome. Oh, I'm so glad. So, so glad. It's been amazing for me as well. I love talking about this stuff. It makes me really happy. So thank you so much, honestly, from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being a part of this. And um, ah. I'll leave all of your social media links and a link to your amazing online home um, just below this video. So everyone, please go and check Maddie out. She is absolutely incredible. She practices everything that she preaches. And um, yeah, she's an awesome, incredible leader for, for our generation. So thank you so much for being a part of this. And um, yeah. yeah, I'll talk to you soon. <laughs> all right. Thank you.